and good evening. I'm Melissa Ickes. Welcome to The Future is Female. This is the show where we find the extraordinary in every woman. I'm delighted to introduce my guest today, Lim Sin Yu, who is one of the co-founders of the Asli Co, which is a social enterprise that aims to provide opportunities to Orang Asli mothers to earn a sustainable income from home. Welcome to the show, Sin. It's good of you to join me uh, today. I would love to hear a little bit about how you came to start um, as the Asli Co. A little bit about your journey, mm -hmm. because I am fascinated by the idea of, um, you know, helping or Asli. But but that being uh, that that idea coming out from the opportunities um, that you've you've experienced yourself. Yeah, um, I guess the first encounter we had, uh, me and my partner had with uh, Orang Asli was through our volunteering um, experience. And for me, it was about 2014 when I started this journey. It, I must say it's a life-changing journey. Um, we volunteered with this organization called Epic Homes, and we built a house for an Orang Asli family in three days. And so through that, we found out that many Orang Asli families live in poverty. Mm. And, and then through our continuous uh, volunteering, mm. we actually found out that um, there's a serious problem in the community and about 25% of students drop out of school. And that actually compounds over the years. So yearly, 25% drop out of school. So wow. about 100, if 100 students started in primary one, I think by the end of uh, form five, only four or less than 10 are left. Wow. Yeah, so that's a huge problem. Yeah. And so we decided to ask the Ketua Kampung why. Why does, why does this happen? Mm. And so they say that it's usually due to um, parents not having enough money for school uniforms, school fees and supplies. And when we asked further, mom said they need around 100 to 150 ringgit per month to support their children to school. So we thought, okay, this is a small amount. Maybe we could try to help. Right. But uh, on second thought, we were like, how, how much can we help if we were to donate on a personal, uh, personal level? Right, yeah. So, so you didn't want it to be charity. You didn't yes. want it to be donation-based. Yes. So we thought on an idea, which is to, for them to produce uh, products that we help market and sell. Mm -hmm. So our first product came about, and it was the succulent pots, which was our hobby at the time. <laughs> and this started as a, a small project that we wanted to help one family and we proceeded to do that and the response from the public was uh, amazing actually when we went to our first bazaar we sold out all the pots and we realized that this is something that we could do long term and so um, we started with more products that ladies could make and we have now um, made soaps uh, lavender eye pillows pillow mist so on and now we have over 60 mothers who are trained to make our products. And our model is such that we provide all the training, all the materials, and also uh, all the equipment to the ladies so that they can then start working okay. from home. So, so walk me through the process. Yeah. So you had this idea, you wanted it to be a social enterprise yes. to create sustainable income. Yes. Sustainable recurring income. Yeah. So the idea is, so you bring the materials and products to the mm. Orangsli Kampongs, yes. work with specific women, specific yes. families, yes. and then teach them how to make the product. Yes. Is that right? Okay. Correct. So um, we would identify women who are uh, wanting to work, and then uh, we'll go into the Kampong, we'll have workshops to teach them how to make our products. And then we send all the materials to the village, and then they'll produce it, okay. and then we go and collect it back. And then yeah then market it to the public? You would yes. handle the marketing of the public? That's right. And what kind of share of revenue would the mothers, the Oransi mothers see? Mm. The product, up to 20% uh, of the revenue is actually going back directly to the mothers as their wages for producing it. Oh. So it's a, a big amount. So in the years that you've uh, been operating this, mm -hmm. have, how have you seen the impact of having sustainable income to these households, um, hoping that it helps them break that cycle of poverty. Could you share some of your stories? Yeah. So um, 
mothers usually uh, struggle to find work near the villages once they have young children. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they like mobility because they need to be close to their young children. And normally it, in, an in a household, there's only one vehicle, which is a motorbike. Mm -hmm. And normally the husbands would be using that to go out to work. And so mothers lack uh, job opportunities in the village. So why? That's why we decided to bring the work to them oh, in the so village. So it was important to have yes. work that they could, could do in the home. That's right. So all our products are designed so that it can be made comfortably from home and it gives them flexible time to then uh, organize time for their children and also time for work. Many of our mothers only work uh, very part-time hours, mm -hmm. so about maybe mm, four to eight hours yeah. a week, but they're able to get income that is equivalent to working full-time Monday to Saturday. Yeah, so that's what oh, we've wow. been very proud of. So they, they yeah. actually get a full-time income despite having the flexible yes. work yes. arrangements. Yes. How have you managed to grow that team from starting with maybe one mother to building the capacity? Yeah. So, so far, uh, all of the mothers are uh, come through word of mouth because uh, one mother would then... Um, outgrow the capacity. <laughs> she, that, there's only so much she can do yes. at that time. <laughs> and so she would introduce other mothers who are also in need of uh, searching for jobs mm. that could give them the same flexibility and also the income. And um, so we would get uh, their, their cousins, their friends, their other uh, relatives from other kampongs. Yeah. Patsuka, have you heard about how it might have impacted their children? Have they been able to stay in school? Yeah. Because that was the original yep. plan all along, wasn't it? Yeah. So uh, now they have no more trouble uh, providing for their ki uh, kids' education, but they are also able to help supplement their household in income. Uh, definitely the um, food is not an issue anymore, mm. and they can also have some money for themselves. Uh, more importantly, I think they've been able to upgrade their lifestyles to uh, through purchasing electrical appliances, cooking appliances, fridges, washing machines, and so on. And you've seen this happen progressively yes. throughout yes. your working with them. How do you work with them? Because I, I know that the Asliko emphasizes dignity and self-sufficiency mm. when working with Orang Asli mothers. How do you ensure that you, the way you're working with them, you're working with them as stakeholders, not just as employees, but stakeholders, as, as members of the team, making sure that you mm. foster this philosophy of, of self-sufficiency and empowerment. Mm. When, when we work with them, we always do it through a collaborative measure. Um, we would definitely ask for their opinions and also their input mm -hmm. on the products that we're making you know is it too hard to make it you know with young children about we if it is then we would change the procedures we would change the systems right. so that they could they could still do it uh, properly at home and also in our office um, we also um, ensure that they have enough to be uh, self-sufficient mm -hmm. as well so we try to market our products as much as possible so that they get a steady income every month. Yeah, that, that's the other question, right? Sometimes income can be sporadic. Yes. So how do you ensure that it's not just kind of temporary relief, mm. that there is recurring income that's being generated mm. so that mothers can plan for household expenditures, yep. can invest in things that, that will uplift their households? Yeah. So far, that's our challenge so far. Yeah, that's been a challenge. Yeah, okay. but we've been, um, we've been working with growing demand in the, um, so that we can actually give them a steady, sustainable income. Of course, there are months that do better. Mm. For example, Christmas, the, 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 the month of giving, <laughs> yeah, where we see a, a massive uptake in our products. Right. Yeah, so we're still working on that. But so far, I think the ladies have been able to get a... a steady income, mm. albeit not too much. Okay. I, want, I wanted to talk about the demand side, but let's yes. focus on the supply side first, okay. uh, temporarily. Um, in, in terms of supply and making sure that you're creating products that resonate with customers. Mm. And I understand the challenge because you're trying to think about products that can be created in the home that aren't too intricate or difficult for mothers with very young children, other caregiving duties, but mm. also you want to make sure that 
there's a demand in the market yes. that it's it's you know um, attractive to consumers. Yeah. How do you balance that? Mm, so far, I think we've been uh, looking at trends in the market. Um, we've also, I think, in the past, been fortunate during the pandemic mm. to be able to um, produce hand sanitizers and also fabric face masks that are hand sewn. Uh, right. So those have helped us through the pandemic years to weather through the difficult times. So you started just before the pandemic. Right before. Right the before the pandemic. Yes. And then had the kind of restrictions in place. Yes. When you are, how how did how did you deal <laughs> how, with the pandemic years? <laughs> okay. So I was mostly stuck at home, but my partner, um, we had uh, the. Um, uh, the letter from from the police to actually travel to the villages because we are producing uh, essential items. So we oh, were masks. partially yeah right. partially able to travel okay. uh, to the villages and continue our business. And thankfully, that was what helped them through the pandemic as well. Because yeah. during that time, their husbands were all stuck at home and there was zero income. So that actually oh, so helped put food on the table during the pandemic. So during the pandemic, really, that was the only source of income for yes. many households. Yes. Okay. So it was it was really a blessing that you were able to continue yes. operations. So many businesses had to close, to, to close down and stop. How, in terms of kind of financial uh, longevity, how did mm. you survive? How did you, was there financial wherewithal during that period um, to survive it? So there was a, a a great demand of hand sanitizers and face masks during that time. So, and we were thankful uh, to uh, corporates who actually purchased a lot from us. Um, so, th it was actually a good time during the pandemic. And uh, e-commerce sales were also high during oh, then because good. everyone was stuck at home and there was no nothing to do but to shop online. Mm, okay. Yes. All right. We'll come back and talk a little bit about some of those corporate clients that you yes. mentioned. We're going to take a very quick break here on the Future Three Mail. We'll be right back. Stay tuned. Hi, welcome back to The Future. It's three months. continue our conversation with Lim Sin Yu, co-founder of The Asli Co, which is a social enterprise that um, is providing opportunities for our Asli mothers to earn a sustainable income from the comforts of their own home. Can we talk a little bit about um, collaboration with corporate clients? That was how I came across your company, your, your social enterprise. I received a door gift from one of your corporate clients and had never heard of the name of the company before, but was really delighted by the quality and the functional, <laughs> the use of the product. I had one of those lavender eye uh, pillows. pillows that you, you talked about. And um, I wanted to think through the collaboration with businesses because that seems to be the bulk of your business. You do yes. more B2B as opposed yes. to B2C. Yeah. How do you work with um, companies who are now focused on ESG, um, who are focused on their social impact. How, um, how has that been for you in terms of asking for help and um, spreading the message, the work that you do through co uh, corporate collaborations? Mm. It's uh, exactly like you said, um, companies are now very focused on ESG efforts. Mm. Uh, and we definitely fulfill the part of the S, which is social, uh, social part of the uh, governments. Mm. And um, so companies have actually been actively uh, reaching out to us to purchase our products. Oh, they seek you. Yes. Oh, that's which wonderful. Is yes. Wonderful. And what we can, what we have been able to do is to customize our products to their colors, include their logos. And they love it because then they give out gifts that have their branding, mm. but also give back to the community at the same time. So, so far, corporates have been loving our products because mm. of uh, it being a win-win. They need to buy gifts, but they also want to help a local community. Mm. And, and I think because corporates also have a, a large budget usually for their gifts, gift things, they can actually help impact lots of social enterprises in Malaysia through social procurement. Yeah, so for, you know, 
all the corporates watching yes. us there. <laughs> what message would you like to convey mm. about um, working with social enterprises like yours, about the need for it being more than just a, a financial transaction, that mm. there is a social impact, that there can be a ripple effect mm. uh, working with social enterprises like the ASCICO? Mm. So I think to um, corporates out there, if you're looking for gifts that are that would help touch the lives of local communities, um, look out for social enterprises that w that help the communities that you care about. Mm -hmm. Many of us uh, work with B40 communities, mothers, empower women. So definitely, if you buy. Uh, items or get services from these uh, social enterprises, you would help impact the community in, with like a long-lasting effect. And the more you do this, the more good we can do. And together, as a whole, as a community, we can Was do so much. Was that always the, um, the, the strategy to work with corporates, to collaborate with corporates, as opposed to finding a mass consumer market? Because that can mm. be tricky. Um, and, you know, it's a very crowded space. You have to make your brand known. Mm. That's lot, spends a lot of money marketing. You have a great story, but you'll still have to make yourself visible in a very noisy arena. Mm. Was that always the plan to work with corporates? I think we kind of fell into that plan once we found that actually corporates are so supportive of what we're doing. How did you convince <laughs> the first one to get on board? Um, <laughs> hmm. Uh, we joined, I think, a, a program called Jumpstart by Hong Leong Bank. Oh, right. And they, they were looking for social enterprises to assist, but not through like a donation. They want to really help us succeed. And so we applied and then they started helping us with, uh, by procuring items from us, the hand sanitizers. They bought 3,000 liters of it. Wow. And that kind of kickstart our journey as well. So, but and then through there, because they gave out the gifts, and then more corporates started seeing it. Mm. So that's actually how it fell into place. <laughs> that's really wonderful. The, and it's, it's good for corporates to support social enterprises, because mm. sometimes social enterprises are the bridge mm. between business and social impact. Yes. And often, um, it can be a struggle. Mm. Uh, the long-term sustainability of social enterprises can be challenging. Yes. How do you, first of all, how would you measure the mm. success of a social enterprise like the Ask Eco? Are there, do you do you need to set KPIs? Do you, who do you who are you accountable to in terms of you know being a social enterprise? So far, for us, I think each social enterprise measures their impact differently. Mm -hmm. But for us, it's definitely the um, ladies' income. So mothers' income would directly link to whether their children can finish school or whether they can provide for their family. So we measure that. And how much are we able to give back to them in terms of that? So the more income yeah. they get, the more you consider yourself a success. Yes. So that is true. The more products that we are able to sell, and so that is a direct measurement of what, success. What would be the highest um, amount that uh, a household could earn? So, uh, in good months, when there are massive orders from large corporations, uh, mothers can earn up to three thousand ringgit per month by doing work for about a week. Yeah, that's really wonderful. That is actually a, a decent income, and with that income able to break the cycle of poverty, yeah. able to have some social mobility. Um, how do you foresee the growth of your social enterprise? Mm. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but sometimes social enterprises struggle to scale. Um, and at a certain point, they find they cannot scale enough and mm. they, they exit. Yeah. So what, what about you? How do you mm. envision the growth of the Aslico? I think we want to be able to bring mothers the steady income. Imagine if one day we could give each mother 3,000 ringgit a month. That would be our goal, our dream, to be able to provide that for all the mothers working with us. So what we've been doing now is to look at overseas markets, Singapore, mm. US. So we'd like to go into other markets to then expand uh, our demand of our products so that then each mother will be able to earn enough for their children. Yeah. And in the past four years, as the company, as the, the enterprise has evolved, how, 
uh, were there lessons that you kind of learned along the way that you had to maybe learn the hard way? <laughs> <laughs> you you probably would not repeat the same mistakes again. What would you what in hindsight mm -hmm. now? What would you say you learned along the way? I guess uh, having setting the goal to be um, sustainable and profitable from day one was what we did correctly. Okay. So we knew that. Um, we cannot be relying on donations to keep our social enterprise going. We cannot be purely relying on grants as well because those are hard to come by. Mm. So we needed to have a business model that is uh, very sound and uh, that each of our products sold, we, are, we ensure that we don't lose money. So that was what we started out with and I think that is a very important lesson for any social enterprises out there. Is that, is that a common mistake that some social enterprises make? It, it may be because okay. uh, perhaps there's a need to balance the impact and profitability. Mm. So without that, if you're focused fully on impact, so you might be burning out. Yeah, but so far I think having the enterprise uh, go long term is a better way than short term large impact right so yes. so incremental impact yes. over the long term and, and i like that because some of the lessons that you've learned can also be um you know taken to heart for other social enterprises as well if there are people who have been thinking about wanting to pursue this or are already in you know the, their journey of social enterprise are there things that you would like them, aspiring social <laughs> entrepreneurs, to know yeah. about about getting into this space? It is it's wonderful work, but mm. it's undeniably hard work, isn't it? Yeah, I think it's uh, if you have the the want to start a social enterprise, please do. Uh, there's more, um, I think, more people needing help out there or needing opportunities to better their lives, and you can definitely help by making small steps. And nowadays, there are many um, help provided to social enterprises as well, uh, from government, uh, gov the government, um, the also corporates who are very willing to be on board right. if you were able to give them a, a good proposal as to how they can help your social initiative. Mm -hmm. Many, uh, I would say, um, said. Yeah, th there are there, there are, are networks to, to, yes. to support. Yes, so nowadays it's much easier than, than back then, D I think. Did you get support when you were starting out? Did, is there a, a network of social entrepreneurs who can help each other mm. to say, hey, this grant is available, this corporate yes. is willing? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, in fact, there's a very supportive uh, group of social entrepreneurs in Malaysia that are helping each other out. Okay. We're in, the, in that group as well. So. Um, they can join this group and, <laughs> and then definitely get help where, where it's needed. So you, you're not alone if you start no, your entrepreneurship no. journey. You can have support and help from yes, a wider network. Definitely. That's wonderful to hear. And hopefully, we'll encourage more people to, to think about a social impact of their enterprises. Yeah, yeah. appreciate your time. Thank you so much for joining me on the show today. I appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. Thanks for having me. That's all we have for you on this episode of The Future is Female. I'm Melissa Idris, signing off for the evening. Thank you so much for watching. Good night.